This is Chapter 5, Development, Form, and Eruption. So uh, during the sixth week of fetal life, you have tooth buds called tooth germs that begin to grow within the alveolar process of the fetus. These tooth germs are small clumps of cells that have the ability to form the tooth tissues, which include the enamel, the dentin, the cementum, and the pulp. Both primary and secondary teeth develop from these tooth germs, which later are located within the cavities of the alveolar process called crypts. It's at this time that the dentin and enamel begin to form, followed later in the development by the cementum. The type of dentin that's formed at this early stage is called primary dentin, and it occurs before root completion. Secondary dentin is continually formed within the tooth by the same odontoblasts that form regular dentin. And this process continues throughout one's entire lifetime. Now, secondary dentin differs from reparative dentin in that reparative dentin is laid down locally as protection for the pulp um, from irritation, caries, or trauma. The earliest evidence of tooth formation occurs during the sixth week of embryonic life. It's at this time that the dental lamina begins to form, and the primary teeth begin to calcify by about the fourth or fifth month of fetal life. Calcification is the hardening of tooth surfaces by the deposition of mineral salts within these tissues. This continues until about a third or fourth year after birth when the deciduous roots become fully formed. Soon after birth, the permanent teeth begin to calcify and continue until about the age of 25 when the roots of the third molars or wisdom teeth become calcified. The last area of the tooth to become calcified is the apex of the root, and that's where you have your cellular cementum. Each tooth begins to develop from four or more growth centers, and these growth centers um, grow out from the tooth germ and are known as developmental lobes. The lobes grow and develop within their bony crypt until they fuse, and it's this fusion of the lobes that's called coalescence. The junction that forms the union of these lobes is marked by the lines on the tooth called developmental grooves, and that can be seen on the tooth after it has erupted. The number of developmental lobes necessary for the formation of a tooth really depends on the particular tooth and how many cusps it has. All the anterior teeth develop from four lobes. You have three facial lobes and one lingual lobe. The mammalons, which are evident after eruption of incisor teeth, are um, the incisal ridges of those three labial developmental lobes and are separated by a developmental groove. And this picture shows you the mammalons. The three labial developmental lobes are mesiofacial, centrofacial, and distofacial. And the lingual lobe makes up the cingulum of the lingual surface of the tooth. Now for premolars, the maxillary premolars also have three facial lobes and one lingual lobe. The three facial lobes form one big high buccal cusp and the lingual lobe forms a single, a single large lingual cusp. So that forms into a cusp instead of a cingulum. So, the first premolar, you have four lobes, three on the buccal, one on the lingual. The names of the lobes are the same as with the anterior teeth, mesiofacial, centrofacial, distofacial, and then your lingual is number four. The mandibular and maxillary first premolar have the same number and arrangement of lobes. The lingual cusp of the mandibular first premolar, though, is smaller than its maxillary counterpart. The mandibular second molar varies. It can have two cusps or three cusps, which is why we no longer call these teeth bicuspids because some might have three cusps. The two cusp variety has the same number and arrangement of lobes as the mandibular first premolar, but the lingual cusp is longer. The facial lobes and cusps of the three cusp man, uh, mandibular second molar are the same as the first premolar. The only difference is in the lingual lobes. 
there are two lobes, mesiolingual and distolingual, resulting in two separate lingual cusps. The mesiolingual cusp is usually larger than the distolingual cusp, and that is one of the generalities. The mesial is going to be larger than the distal. The buccal is going to be bigger than the um, lingual. So the difference is also apparent in the number and location of the developmental grooves with the additional groove between the two lingual cusps. Now that's for the three cusp type. Now let's talk about molars. This obviously is a maxillary molar, you can see, because it has three roots. If you know nothing else, maxillary molars usually have three roots. But we're talking about cusps here, the lobes and cusps. All molars have two facial and two lingual cusps, except the maxillary first molar usually has a fifth cusp or minor lobe. It's a rudimentary lobe, and it's called the lobe of Carabelli or the cusp of Carabelli. Each of the four major and minor lobes develops into a cusp, which is named according to its lobe. So the lobe of Carabelli, which we call the cusp of Carabelli, uh, which is located on the lingual surface of the mesial lingual cusp, develops into a tubercle, which is a small cusp-like elevation. It's not a true cusp. Now the second molars are usually much smaller than the first in that all cusp proportions and the distolingual cusp is even smaller in proportion on the second molar compared to the first. This cusp becomes smaller as the location becomes more posterior. So the first molar is going to have the largest distolingual cusp, second molar the smaller of the two distolingual cusps, sometimes missing, and the third molar oftentimes has a distolingual cusp missing altogether. And that means it only has three cusps. Additionally, the crown uh, is usually smaller and the roots are shorter uh, than the second molar and first molar. So we're talking third molars. Third molars are the most unpredictable of all teeth. They are more likely to be poorly formed and have a variety of cusps. So this particular picture shows you on the left, the max, um, upper left and lower left. Okay, the upper is the maxillary teeth. The lower pictures are the mandibular teeth, first, second, and third molars. And you can see the first molars are quite large compared to the second molar, and then the third molar is even smaller. So the first teeth to emerge into the oral cavity are the deciduous or primary teeth. Calcification of these teeth begins around the fourth month of fetal life. Notice I've said that more than once. Do you think this is important? By the end of the sixth month, all the deciduous teeth have begun to develop. Normally, no teeth, no teeth are visible in the mouth at birth, but occasionally infants are, are born with the erupted incisor teeth, but they are premature teeth and they're usually lost after birth. So they are not considered part of the deciduous dentition. The calcification process first forms the crown of the tooth with the root formation following later. So no two people are exactly alike in the calcification crown and root formation, or the eruption schedules. During enamel and dentin development, minerals are deposited in the forming of tooth germs. Any fever, metabolic dysfunction, childhood or nutritional disease, or physical illness or trauma can alter the formation of the teeth and even stop their formation or mineralization completely. Although dentition varies somewhat in all people, there are certain approximations or averages that are recognizable, and that's what we are expecting you to know. I love this picture. I love it. it uh, I, I'm more of a visual person, and I like having this in my oral health book because it really does demonstrate to anybody, child, adult, grandparent, whoever, the stages of tooth development. So let's talk some general rules. Mandibular teeth usually precede or come before the maxillary teeth in the eruption process. Teeth in both jaws erupt in pairs. So one on the right and then one on the left, or one on the left and then one on the right, but they usually erupt in pairs. 
permanent teeth usually erupt slightly earlier in girls than in boys, and a sex difference really isn't noted in the deciduous teeth. Mandibular central incisors erupt at about six to 12 months of age, followed approximately one month later by the maxillary centrals. And then the mandibular laterals emerge at about the seventh month, followed approximately one month later by the maxillary laterals. So while the mandibular laterals are coming in, the maxillary centrals are trying to come in at the same time. Mandibular first molars erupt at approximately 12 to 19 months of age, closely followed by the maxillary first molars. Then we've got the canines that erupt between 16 and 22 months of age, followed by the second molars, which are about 21 to 33 months. Now the first molars, deciduous molars, are oftentimes called one-year molars because that's about the age when children get them. And the second molars, deciduous second molars, are oftentimes called the second year molars or two year molars. All of the deciduous teeth are expected to have erupted by the time the child is about two and a half years of age. So for the next 36 months as the child continues to grow, so do the jaws and that supports the teeth. The erupted teeth however, do not become any larger. So because of that, by the age of five, it's normal to have spaces and separations between the teeth caused by the increased growth of the jaw. So if we have a five-year-old coming into the um, office or into your chair and they have beautiful dentition, everything's in alignment and everything is touching and there's no crowding, we're telling that parent to start their orthodontic fund because the jaws aren't large enough to accommodate the permanent teeth. The deciduous teeth must remain intact to retain the proper spacing for the permanent teeth that replace them. And this is something that's important for parents to understand. They think that, oh, they're just baby teeth or milk teeth, they're not the permanent teeth, they don't have any function or any consequence if they're decayed or if they fall out early. The deciduous dental arch must else also help guide the first permanent molars into their normal position. These molars act as the foundation for the rest of the permanent dentition. So the first teeth of the permanent dentition to emerge are usually the mandibular first molars, followed by the maxillary first molars within a few weeks. They emerge immediately distal to the deciduous second molars. So because they don't replace any of the deciduous teeth, they are not considered succedaneous. They're often called six-year molars because they erupt at approximately six years of age. And along with the eruption of the permanent molars comes the phenomenon of mesial drift. Now, mesial drift is the tendency of the permanent molars to have an eruptive force towards the midline. Everything wants to shift towards the midline. Mesial drift affects the deciduous dentition in two ways. First, the spaces between the deciduous teeth are closed as the first molar pushes the deciduous molars together. And if the deciduous tooth is prematurely lost, the permanent first molar then moves mesially into the available space. So that can keep that premolar from erupting because it will become impacted. This is a picture of somebody who is younger than 12 years old. They're older than six years old. Um, you can see that you can see beautiful mammalons on the mandibular and maxillary central incisors. They've lost the four deciduous um, anterior teeth on the mandible. They've lost uh, three deciduous teeth on the maxillary. They still have a retained lateral incisor. Their six-year molars, their first molars have erupted. The roots are not fully formed yet or closed. So that's letting me know that they are younger than eight years of age. And their 12-year molars, you can just see behind that, their second molars are still developing. So that's how you sort of gauge how old the child is. So the next permanent teeth to erupt are the central incisors. And the mandibular incisors erupt at about six to seven years of age and the maxillary incisors erupt at about seven to eight years of age. So notice at about that six year age, that mouth is really changing with the eruption of 
the first molar, permanent molars, as well as the exfoliation of the deciduous anterior teeth. The permanent incisors take over the position of the deciduous incisors, so they need that space to accommodate the larger tooth. This is made possible because the deciduous incisors are exfoliated. Now, exfoliation is the process by which the roots of a deciduous tooth are resorbed, causing the tooth to become loose because it doesn't have a root to anchor it anymore. It becomes loose and it exfoliates or falls out. The pressure brought to bear on the deciduous root by the eruption of the permanent tooth triggers the body to activate the bone-destroying cells called osteoclasts, which destroy the roots of the deciduous teeth. So it is not uncommon for the permanent incisors to erupt lingually to the deciduous incisors. Uh, when the deciduous tooth is finally lost, the pressure from the tongue forces the permanent tooth facially until it occupies the correct position. But this again is when parents will call and ask, you know, my, my son or daughter has two rows of teeth coming in. So we need to let them know that this is a normal phenomenon. So the next teeth to erupt are the lateral incisors at about seven to nine years of age, followed by the uh, mandibular canines at nine to 10. Now the maxillary canines do not erupt at this time. They erupt at about 11 or 12 years of age. The mandibular canines then erupt at 10 to 12, followed by the mandibular first premolars. Then the maxillary premolars erupt at about the same time or may even be earlier. So their mouth is just a hot mess. The second premolars erupt at 10 to 12 years of age with the maxillary premolars often preceding the eruption of the mandibular. So this is an exception to the rule. Remember the mandibular usually erupts before the maxillary except for the maxillary premolars. At about 12 to 13 years of age, the mandibular second molars emerge, followed within months by the maxillary counterparts. So the maxillary, I'm sorry, the permanent second molars are often called the 12-year molars. Third molars or wisdom teeth don't appear until about the age of 17. Um, these teeth are oftentimes impacted and impaction means that they do not completely erupt or cannot erupt, but remain embedded in bone or soft tissue. Mandibular third molars are most often affected because the mandible has to grow enough to accommodate them. And the maxillary third molars are the next most likely teeth to be impacted after the mandibular. Third molars, maxillary and mandibular are also the most common teeth to be congenitally missing. This is a good test question. The, a congenitally missing tooth is one that never forms because the tooth bud was never produced from which it could form. And this can be an hereditary trait. Uh, these are the guidelines of the permanent dentition on the maxillary arch. The next slide will show you the permanent dentition of the mandibular arch. And as the teeth erupt and meet their antagonist or the tooth on the opposite arch, uh, they form what's known as the occlusal plane. One term you need to know is something called the curve of speed. And this is the lateral view from the anterior to posterior and the curve alignment is called the curve of C. The period of primary dentition begins with the eruption of the first deciduous tooth and lasts as long as only deciduous teeth are present. When the first permanent molar erupts at about six years of age, the period of mixed dentition begins. And this period exists while both primary and secondary teeth are simultaneously present and ends when the last deciduous tooth is exfoliated and only permanent teeth remain. So if, a, if an adult has a retained deciduous tooth because they did not have a permanent tooth, they are in a forever state of mixed dentition. The period of permanent dentition begins when the last primary tooth is lost and ends when the last permanent tooth is lost. This period usually begins at about 12 years of age 
and hopefully will never end because our goal is to have teeth until we die. If all the permanent teeth are lost, the condition is then termed edentulous, meaning no teeth. Another picture, I think this one came from your book. This is of an older person. Um, the, you can see that there are only two retained deciduous teeth, the mandibular second premolars. Their six year molars or first molars have erupted with root completion. Their second molars have erupted without root completion. So that means if you're adding two years for root completion, 12, 13, 14 maybe, and you can see the tooth buds starting to form where the wisdom teeth are. So that is it for chapter five.